We're all familiar with this style of animation, right? It's that style of animation that we most associate with studios like Trigger, or Science Saru, or Gainax, or any other studio that was noted for making projects that relied heavily on this kind of animation. The animation style that is all about the movement, showing little to no concern for keeping things on model in the service of making the animation look good in motion. It's a style that has many names, like the runny egg style, or the gynax style. But of course, such a visually distinct style of animation didn't just spring fully formed from the ether, and it was also not invented by gynax, so let's nip that incorrect notion in the bud right now. No, the vast majority of truly wild and innovative sakuga has its basis in the work of one very influential animator, Yoshinori Kaneda. The name might not sound familiar to most people, as he was an animator who never really got the chance to sit in the director's chair like those influenced by him. But that influence is one that stretches throughout anime history far and wide. Kaneda was an animator's animator, the root by which all wild, movement-focused animation in anime is derived from. In his development of what people have referred to as the Kaneda School of Animation, Kaneda is responsible for both directly and indirectly inspiring generation upon generation of animators. He directly taught future animation gods like Masahiro Yamashita, Mitsumi Inomata, and Koji Ito, on top of indirectly influencing contemporaries like Ichiro Itano and Takashi Nakamura. Masami Obari specifically cited Kaneda as the primary influence in developing his own unique style, with him saying that Kaneda was the reason he was drawn into mecha anime in the first place. Takashi Murakami credits Kaneda's style for being a vital piece for perfecting his own super flat art movement. And Hiroyuki Imaishi, on top of inventing a style that harkens back to the tenets of the Kaneda school so much that it has been dubbed the Neo Kaneda school, dedicated the final episode of Panning and Stocking with Garterbelt to Kaneda's memory in the wake of his untimely passing in 2009. Kaneda's influence in the industry is so profound that even anime's resident unpleasable dad Hayao Miyazaki couldn't help but offer praise towards him, saying that Kaneda had always been true to himself throughout his work. This guy can't even muster compliments towards his own son, and yet, Kaneda managed to do the impossible and get Miyazaki to say nice things about him. But like I said, for a guy who appears to have been a pillar of how anime is animated up to this very day, he seems largely unknown amongst the greater anime fandom all because he never directed anything. No work for anyone to really call a Kaneda anime. But he did get close. On the ironically named desert planet Aqualoid, a main character named Nam finds a mysterious sword that may or may not hold a mysterious spirit called Arlia. Like most things in anime, this turns out to be a completely bad move on his part because taking that mysterious sword of mysteriousness now involves him in a chase with a race of robotic overlords humanity suffers under the boot of known as the Inorganics. Joining Nam in this kookier version of Mad Max Fury Road is Rasa, a local girl who enjoys riding on her hoverbike with her pet, whatever that thing is, Manga. <laughs> And Bao, the self-proclaimed greatest space merchant in all the universe, who seeks the sword along with any other bric-a-brac he could sell to the Space Force for a hefty markup.
acting as Kiff's to Bao's Zap Brannigan is Bao's swishy assistant Kim, who's just along for the ride. Together, these four unsuspecting mercenaries are caught in a seemingly endless chase, one that leads them to the secret of both the sword and their home planet. What will they find, and will it save their world, or destroy it? ...1984's Birth is a film that I think only the most manic of maniac anime nerds know of. Everything about it just seems to scream weird obscurity, exacerbated by the fact that this was one of the first OVAs released at the dawn of the direct-to-video market. But with that intro, I'm sure many of you can guess that this is an anime with some serious pedigree. Yoshinori Kaneda may not have been the director of Birth, but in many ways, it would not have been brought into this world if it wasn't for his involvement. For exactly 1 hour and 15 minutes, Kaneda shows you just how he operates as a creator. Birth is a film that has a surprising amount of backstory behind it, and to say that it left a mark on anime history after its release would probably be an understatement. I know I like to say that about most anime on this show, but this one is different. It feels like an uncovered artifact that just so happens to be central to learning about the development of our modern civilization. The Rosetta Stone of Weird Sakuga. Kyoto Video is the center for anime archaeology and we take our jobs very seriously. Which is why I bring you the story of birth. The before, the during, and the after, and why all three parts matter when it comes to knowing anime. <laughs> Yoshinori Kaneda was born on February 5th, 1952 in Nara, Japan. The son of an Air Force pilot, he initially wanted to follow in his father's footsteps. However, his poor eyesight ended those dreams before they even began, so he would have to find a new future to pursue. He would soon find it in high school around 1969 when he took in a showing of the Toei animation movie Flying Phantom Ship. He was taken in by the level of animation on display, in particular the golem scene which was animated by a young Toei wunderkind named Hayao Miyazaki. The young Kaneda knew that this was going to be the path he was destined to take. After taking a correspondence course in animation, he enrolled at the Tokyo designer Gakuin's animation department. By 1970, he became a contract employee for Toei Animation, making his debut as an animator on the magical girl show Magical Mako-chan. After leaving Toei, Kaneda traveled around working at freelance studios throughout the 70s. Studios like Shingo Araki's Studio Z and Takuo Noda's Studio No. 1. It was at these studios where he developed what is now known as the Kaneda School of Animation. The Kaneda School refers to a unique drawing style that Kaneda developed that prioritized good movement over everything else. He had built the school on the foundation set up by a prior school of animation known as the APRO School, which had been developed by Yasuo Otsuka at TMS Sub Studio A Production. It was a drawing style that emphasized exaggerated key poses and spacing to get the most out of the limited confines of television animation. Kaneda took that philosophy to the next level by not just utilizing exaggerated posing, but also creative perspectives and framing to sell the power of the movement on screen. Originally, this style was only used as a last resort to expand expressiveness within the typical anime TV budget of the 70s, because in order to pull off these types of shots, Kaneda and his team often had to omit in-between frames and break character models to make them work. But after a while, creators noticed that the Kaneda school made certain cuts feel more impactful. Pretty soon, that style was Yoshinori Kaneda's trademark, and had introduced the idea of an animator bringing their own idiosyncrasies to their animation. Kaneda became a name to know, both within the industry and the nascent anime fandom that was beginning to take form around this time. Fast forward to May of 1980, Kaneda is storyboarding the sixth episode of the Ashi Pro produced anime, Tukoke Night Don de la Mancha. This is important for two reasons. One, it's Kaneda's third gig as a storyboarder and his first gig to use original character designs of his, and two, it puts him in contact with these four people. Producer Yoshiaki Aihara, director Kunihiko Yuyama, and animators Shigenori Kageyama and Mutsumi Inomata. These four would be important, as they were instrumental in the founding of that famed studio that we've talked about before on this show, Kaname Productions. 
The studio formed on New Year's Day of 1982, but it didn't become a studio proper until that April, it being funded primarily by anime merchandise company Idol with the intention of producing both animated and live action works. In this formation, the four people Kaneda met during his time on Don De La Mancha contacted him and asked him if he wanted in. Kaneda accepted, and it was during what may have been multiple rap sessions and pitching each other ideas for future Konami projects that the concept of birth began to take shape, mostly between Kaneda and screenwriter Junki Takegami. On July of that year, issue number 7 of the magazine Anamedia ran a piece about Kaname and their future projects in their upcoming features article, Anime Hotline. It is here where we see the first mention of Birth. Birth is a sci-fi anime currently in planning that Nobuyoshi Aihara and Yoshinori Kaneda have been working on for a long time, planned to start this autumn or next spring. The main character goes from planet to planet in order to flee from anime attacks, and each planet will be the highlight of the episodes. There will be adventure and romance, and it is planned to be a bit more mature than Mechavenger. If it is actually made, we should be able to enjoy plenty of Kaneda's character and mecha designs. This is obviously very different from the final product. Takegami is not mentioned, and it's clear that it is plotted with the intention of being a TV series instead of a movie. That very same month, Yoshinori Kaneda Special is released, one of the first art books devoted to a singular animator in an official capacity. There's already an entire section devoted to some concept ideas for birth, particularly the characters of Rasa, Nam, Kim, and Arlia, that most likely haven't been conceived around this time. What's interesting is that Kaneda had used prototypes of Rasa and Arlia before, thanks to his habit of drawing unique background characters in his animations. Proto Rasa having first appeared in a dance club scene in episode 23 of Tiger Mask 2, and Arlie appearing briefly in the opening of Genesis Climber Moss Payada. Come September, Birth Picture Book is released. It laid out the initial plot structure Kaneda and Takegami had worked out up to that point, being way more complex and having the character of Arlia being given more focus. It is also very bare bones in his world building, utilizes a lot of tech speak, and carries a more serious tone, almost dry even. At the same time, Kaneda and Takagami put out a manga for birth in the quarterly shonen magazine Ryu. The manga has the same plot as the picture book, only now with extra world building, the setting of birth being portrayed as a ruined universe where the war between organic and inorganic life forms has been raging on for centuries, one in which the organics have clearly already lost. The atmosphere of the manga is a lot darker, and the seemingly heroic protagonist Nam is written to be a more selfish and easily deceived anti-hero. But despite it all, there were a lot more gags being inserted into the pages thanks to Kaneda's influence. He said that as he continued to draw these characters, he became more and more attached to them. Kaneda steadily taking over the formation of birth over Takagami was reflected in the marketing. In an Animage article on Konami Pro, producer Aihara calls it Kaneda's birth. All of this, of course, was just meant to build hype for birth. Through articles, art books, manga, and even an exhibit on Kaneda funded by Idol themselves. All for an anime that hadn't even really been given the green light yet, let alone officially start production. Even after Victor Records put out a birth image album with Joe Saishi and a band called The Birth at the Helm, even after the birth manga had gone on for so long that it moved from Ryu to another magazine called The Motion Comic, it hadn't even entered pre-production at that point. But after more than a year of building hype, Birth finally got the funding to start production on December of 1983. This baby was ready to be born. The reason why it took so long for Birth to get the green lights was because Konami Pro had run into an unexpected problem. Even with sponsors from Tokuma, Victor, and Idol footing the bill, there still was not enough money to make Birth a TV series like it was originally planned. By December, it still had not made enough to enter TV production. But Konami's fortunes changed when a certain anime was released on the 12th of that year. The release of Dallos changed anime and did so at a rapid pace. By proving the financial viability of direct-to-video anime, tons of languishing projects and pilots from around the industry got a second life by switching from TV to OVA. And that's what happened to Birth. On January 20th, 1984, Kaneda made the announcement in the motion comic that production on Birth was finally underway, and that it will be switching from a series format to an hour-long film format. He also made sure to remind people that the final product was going to be very different from the manga. 
there was also the issue of who was going to direct Birth. Some have speculated that Kaneda, despite his heavy involvement in crafting and creating Birth, was never going to actually direct it. That position was reserved specifically for Kunihiko Yuyama, but because Birth had taken so long to get started, by the time it was given the go-ahead, Yuyama was busy with Plaure Sanshiro and pre-production on an untitled project that later became Leta, the Fantastic Adventure of Yoko. So Kaneda called up his friend, Shinya Sadamitsu, to direct Birth which he agreed to do, even though he would be arriving quite late in the anime's development. In February, Sadamitsu assembled the first draft of the storyboard with Kaneda, animation director Shigenori Kageyama, and producer Akihiro Nagao checking and correcting as they saw fit. According to Kageyama though, this process was the most difficult part of production, thanks to Kaneda and Sadamitsu's clashing visions. Making the storyboards was dreadful. We spend an hour on each cut just sitting there in silence. Neither Kaneda nor Sadamitsu would concede anything, so we had to keep thinking until both were satisfied. We couldn't just make a half-baked version that stood somewhere between both of their visions, so we spent a considerable amount of days holed up together just to make the storyboard. In the end, we decided to do something that would bring out the individuality of each animator, where the visuals would be more interesting than the story. These storyboards that draw out each person's individuality are amazing. For instance, a cut that was planned to last 2 seconds would end up lasting 20 seconds. The things only got more troubled as Idol decided that Birth should get a theatrical release as a means to better promote its video release. This meant setting Birth's original release date 4 months ahead in July instead of their targeted November release. Production schedules were already tight around this time, so you can imagine how much this helped things. Plus, this meant that the runtime had to be extended from 60 to 80 minutes to fit better as a feature film, which meant that Kaneda and company had to toss out their entire storyboard draft and start over from scratch. According to producer Nagao, there was not a single day he didn't suffer from stomach aches around this time. Making things even more problematic was screenwriter Junki Takagami leaving the project and jumping ship over to Leda. While he did write a script for Birth, not only did that get tossed aside by Kaneda and Sadamitsu in the storyboarding process, but he was completely shut out of the storyboarding room altogether. This caused Takagami to wash his hands of the whole project and requested his name be kept off the credits. He only appears as original concept assistants. But with him gone, that left Kaneda and Sadamitsu directionless for how they filled the additional 20 minutes, causing them to improvise story beats on the fly. It did not stop the marketing from making bold, sweeping claims about Birth and how standard bearer of anime's new wave Yoshinori Kaneda was going to lead the new generation of the anime world through Birth. The storyboard was finished around April 6th, and after that, things went a bit more smoothly on the animation front. Despite having a 3 month time frame at that point, animation was able to get done thanks to Topgraph loaning some of their animators while they worked on a little known project called Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind. You may have heard of it. Animation was complete by early July, as that was the time voice recording sessions started. The cast was a mix of veterans like Ichiro Nagai as Bao. <laughs> <laughs> Young Seiyu, who had already had a few roles under their belts, like Mina Tominaga as Rasa. <laughs> and complete newcomers like Kazuki Yao making his debut as Nam. Sources tell me that Birth was in the can by at least July 19th, when it was shown for a preview among press and industry heads. While the reception was unknown, it was remarked that it caused a lot of people to realize the full potential of the OVA format. Two days later, Birth finally found its way into theaters, where showings would run up until August 3rd. So how did it go? I stumbled across a lot more research materials than I usually do in making this video. Details of production and marketing I don't usually find when researching this stuff. With that said, I would give anything to really see what happened at that premiere that night. Whatever the audience was expecting after more than a year of hype and build up through magazine articles and manga adaptations, it certainly wasn't this. <laughs> The 
final product of birth is less an exercise in bringing a story to life than it is using the basic foundation of that story as a playground for the animators. The basic ideas that began with birth are still kind of there. Nam, Rasa, Bao, and Kim are still main characters. The setting is mostly the same, though a lot of the granular world building is explored in supplementary material. And the main plot device being centered around a mysterious sword serves as the story's engine. But other than that, it's completely off the rails from there, if Birth was even on any rails to begin with. The story, such as it is, is just a chase scene. Or to be more accurate, a series of chase scenes that combine into one big chase movie. It begins with Rasa's pet critter manga being chased by a big predator, before Rasa gets chased by a robotic biker game, before Nam gets the sword which starts another chase, before Bao and Kim arrive trying to chase down the signal to Aqualoid and get caught up in a chase with two gigantic robots. That's the movie. Nothing but 80 minutes worth of chases. Surprised Chuck Jones didn't have any involvement in this. Knowing the difficulty that went on behind the scenes of tight schedules and creative differences, I'm not shocked at how little focus the plot is given. It's only there to apply structure to what is the actual focus of birth. The animation and the gags. The entire movie is a clinic on what makes Yoshinori Kaneda such an influential animator. It's him and his students showing the audience what the Kaneda school can do. For an anime centered around chase scenes, it feels appropriate that everything is always moving at all times. And if the character models must break to accomplish that, so be it. Birth has nothing but scorn for the model sheets. You put this in front of people who froth at the mouth at heightening consistencies in Steven Universe, and you would have them vomiting in rage in seconds. Kaneda is obviously a major player in defining Birth's look and feel through his concept art, design work, storyboarding, and animation work, but you also have to give credit to the animators keeping up with his vision. You have scenes by Shinsaku Kozma, who carried on the Kaneda school's legacy as much as anybody. <laughs> As well as mecha animator legend Kazuhiro Ochi delivering Burst's best fight scenes between man and robots. <laughs> However, where Kaneda's design work really takes flight in this film is the gags. Kaneda had always flaunted a surrealist sense of humor, but in Birth, that's really taken into overdrive, no doubt helped by the many sleepless nights in the boarding room. <laughs> This is an anime filled to the brim with gags, some obviously set up, <laughs> while others are classic blink and you miss it gags for only the sharpest eyed otaku. It speaks to Kaneda's brand of humor and why he was such an influence to future weirdos like Imaishi. Realism does not exist in his world because he prefers to be complete Looney Tunes. I could just describe some of the funniest gags in this anime that were all clearly born from Kaneda's demented mind. Gags like a kid in Organic who falls into a 5 minute depression montage when Rasa rejects his cat calling. A gigantic inorganic that only screams the name of vegetables being defeated by an entire horde of mangas. <laughs> and let's not forget the entire movie occasionally coming to a stop to check up on the day in the life of a random old couple at home. I think there's also some meta humor in the betrayal of the character of Rasa. Rasa was a character that Kaneda based off his then girlfriend, soon to be wife, Makiko Yoshimura. For that reason, it adds an extra layer to why all the male characters know Rasa and gush over her like fanboys, why the camera is constantly focusing on her butt, and why everyone feels the need to comment that she has such a great jiggly butt. 
it's all just because Kaneda is being the ultimate wife guy. Isn't that just cute? Plus, the tone of the anime is greatly held by Joe Hisaishi's soundtrack, which is this glorious space-age funk score that complements the film's upbeat high-energy nature. <laughs> With all that said, Birth is not without its flaws. For being centered around chase scene after chase scene with barely enough time to breathe, you do get the feeling that both the action and the humor of Birth is running on fumes near the end. Plus, when Birth is reminded of the story already in progress, it can result in some surprisingly grim tonal shifts. Things will mostly be wacky, but when Nam finds the secret weapon that could either save or destroy the world in a bombed out city, all of a sudden, it's serious time now. Which brings us to what might be the most controversial part of Birth, the ending. Our main characters are on the losing end of the battle between the giant and organics that have been chasing them for half the picture, and Nam is wrestling with the choice of using the secret weapon, even though it could possibly destroy the entire planet. But then, the aforementioned inorganic kid shows up, goes on a tearful incel rant, and decides he wants to end it all because Rasa didn't want to go on a date with him, pulling the trigger of the secret weapon, destroying Aqualoid, and killing everybody. <laughs> now it's hard to tell if this shocking Ideon-esque turn of events was planned from the beginning especially since both the picture book and the anime ended on an inconclusive note. But it's really wild to end your comedy sci-fi romp with everyone dying deaths that are played for pure drama. And it only gets stranger when the character of Arlia shows up having a silent conversation with what I can only assume to be her daughter about how this is the way things are and happy birthday to her. I do know this part may have been planned since Takagami and Nagao describe Birth's plot in interviews as about the birth of the universe and civilization, so I guess this is all a the death of one world heralds the birth of a new situation, which I guess it makes sense. It still feels very tacked on, and you can only hear the conversation if you have a certain subtitle track. All I'm saying is that people scratching their head at the Evangelion finale, you know nothing. But those are just my thoughts on Birth. What about everyone else's? In a report on the 830 theatrical premiere, the magazine The Anime reported an overall positive reception. Line out the door, everyone getting a seat, Kaneda, Sadamitsu, and Mina Tominaga in appearance, and people laughed and cheered all throughout the picture. Of course, this article was a puff piece meant to promote the film and its eventual release onto video, so it's hard to gauge if it's accurate or not. But even in this promotional article, it does mention in interviews with fans that, even if they ultimately enjoyed the film, they were still surprised at how gag-focused it turned out to be. Judging from some reactions, people were more expecting a direct adaptation of Kaneda's manga despite what he said at the beginning of the year. And even if the article did reflect a positive atmosphere, that didn't mean that there weren't people burned by this change in direction. Anime journalist Yuichiro Oguro had some really scathing thoughts on the matter in his 2009 retrospective on Birth. When it came out, I was confused. I'm sure other fans felt the same way. We were confused not just because we didn't understand the plot, but because the original work, created by artists whom we admired and who had a lot of freedom, was impossible to enjoy. In other words, we had been thinking something along the lines of, as long as we can see lots of Kaneda's animation, it'll be fun. But Birth, which contains so much of Kaneda's and Kaneda's style animation, was not enjoyable. We couldn't understand what this meant. If anything, Oguro's assessment of the post-birth reception is more accurate when you look at its commercial performance. Idol and Victor were shooting for around 30,000 units sold for birth for its video release. But once it came out on video on September 5th, the final tally ended up being between 7,000 to 10,000 copies, well short of their goal. I did say in my Leta video, which sold around 25,000 copies by comparison, that Birth was a hit, but that's only in retrospect. 
It did eventually find its place in the world by animation fans wanting the closest thing to a truly Kaneda anime, and it's not like it was a massive commercial bomb like other early OVA released around the same time period. Still, its performance might have had a negative effect on Kaneda's career in the long run. He never did get to direct an anime or head up a huge project like Birth after that. He helped Miyazaki out with Nausicaa and soon became a Ghibli regular up until the early 90s. He would eventually leave Japan and set up shop in Hawaii with the video game company Square, storyboarding cutscenes for them, and before anyone asks, yes, that means he did work on Spirits Within. Yoshinori Kaneda stuck with Square Enix for the rest of his life, right up until he died in 2009 of a myocardial infarction at the untimely age of 57. His death sent shockwaves throughout the industry and the fandom alike all of whom mourned and remembered a truly innovative force in the industry. I think it was because of that that Birth got its second life among the Japanese fandom as a cult hit. A shame the same can't be said about America. Birth did get Western releases, but they had their own problems. The first was an early streamlined release under the name Planet Busters. It got a dub produced by that illustrious in quotes company, Harmony Gold, who removed a lot of the surreal humor in favor of making it a more generic sci-fi film to sell to younger audiences. Sadly, I don't have the clips to corroborate this. The second was by ADV Films in 2004, which in spite of getting a good print with a pretty good dub, That was impressive, Jigglybutt. You can do some amazing things. You win. I'm going home. Ended up failing thanks to the American fandom at the time, mostly choosing to not give any retro anime not adjacent to Dragon Ball the time of day. But at the time of this recording, you can find it on Amazon for a reasonable price, surprisingly enough. But even if it is a cult anime in its home country, I feel Birth deserves more recognition. I would even go so far to say that it's a historically important anime, showing one of Japan's most legendary and influential animators at the height of his power, the absolute pinnacle of the Kaneda school in action. Birth's arrival to this world signaled a profound shift into the anime landscape. That unique animation like Kaneda's couldn't just be constrained to just singular cuts, but rather the entire work you see before you. And how privileged we are that we get to bear witness to it to this very day.